So far we've looked at a number of the epistolary conventions typically found in the body of a letter. and We have just a few more before we round off our discussion. So the next one we need to look at is typically called the confidence formula. And you can see that it too has been uh, subjected to careful analysis. You see here a whole book by John White, whom we've referred to earlier. This was his dissertation, and he looked heavily at non-Christian, that is, papyrus letters of that day. And another uh, person looked carefully at it was Olson. And there are slight differences between the two in terms of how fixed a formula this so-called confidence formula is, whether it's fixed or whether it's a little more freestyle, and it should be a confidence expression. But both of these scholars identify something that happens in a repeated way. And again, the, the important part is not just the form that it has, as we said, the payoff comes in its function. And so let's go there. And what you hopefully can quickly see is that when a speaker expresses confidence in their readers, there is a bit of indirect pressure. Now it's positive pressure, but it is pressure for the person to live up to that confidence. So Olson, for instance, says, the evidence of a variety of parallels suggests that such expressions of confidence are usually included to serve a persuasive purpose. Whatever the emotion behind the expression, the function is to undergird the letter's request or admonitions by creating a sense of obligation through praise. That's the key part, that last phrase, uh, the sense of obligation through praise. If I go to my uh, son, for instance, I have a, uh, a son, let's imagine it's a few years ago when uh, you know, he's a teenager and, and still under the, the guideship of uh, my wife and me, and let's imagine that there is a choice he has to make. There's an event that he's already committed himself going to, right, an ongoing commitment. And then there's this second thing that's come up after that, something that he really wants to go to. And so now he's got to wrestle with. So he cancel the first one that he's got an obligation to go to, and then go to the second one, which is more fun and exciting, which he really wants to go to. Now, instead of going to him and say, now, uh, Sam, uh, you know, I want to remind you that you committed yourself to this other thing, and those other people are counting on you, and da 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 da. Instead of doing all of that, we say, now, now Sam, right, uh, mom and dad aren't going to tell you what to do, but we're confident, son, you're going to do the right thing. You're, we're confident, Sam, you're going to make the right decision. Do you see how he might hear that? I mean, it, it, he may not hear it positively because he might actually want to do the second thing, but he wouldn't like to hear it then because it would be like, oh, there's pressure on him. Mom and Dad have praised me. They're expecting me to do the right thing, to make the right decision. And now, am I going to disappoint them or am I going to live up to that praise? And so it's not surprising that, that, that when Paul uses it, that's another way of his persuading his audience. So, for instance, in Philemon, he says, Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. So, if the, if the apostolic parousia, if earlier in Philemon, Paul says, Oh, prepare a room for me, right, because I hope to be delivered in answer to you in to your prayers. If that's a, a more negative threat about I'm coming, you should do what I say. Here's now more the positive challenge, right? Paul is saying to Philemon, you know, the decision's up to you, but I'm confident you're going to make the right choice. I'm confident you're going to make the right choice. And there are other examples where Paul does that too, where he persuades his audience, right? Persuasion through praise, the confidence formula. Well, another thing we meet often in the bodies of letters are something called paranesis. And that's a Greek word, so it may not mean something to you. Maybe if I said exhortation. This is the idea where um, the speaker is exhorting, calling upon the audience to do something, right? This is where action is required of the readers. And so the Greek word is uh, paranesis, and it can be translated exhortation, urging, advice. And we meet paranesis in different forms. Sometimes we meet it just alone, right? You can just have a whole discussion, and then there's just one concluding application comment. But different than that, we have specific forms that can be identified and named, and it's important, therefore, for you to know about these different 
perinesis form. So, for instance, we meet in Paul's letters and in other letters too, these vice list or virtue list, right? Where you have a whole variety of virtues, positive things that Christians should emulate, that they should act out in their life, and the contrast of that, of course, would be viceless. These are all sins. These are these are either the fruit of the Spirit, a good thing, or these are the fruit of the flesh. These are the bad things. And you can see a lot of uh, lengthy lists in the Apostles' letters. And scholars have, well, I won't talk about the function quite yet. I'll hold off. There's a, a different kind of list is often referred to in German as the Haustoffelin. And uh, in English, that would refer to the Household Codes. Why the reference to households? Because these are a series of practical exhortations, practical commands or guidelines for living that follow the structure of a household, a home. And in the ancient world, the most powerful person in a home would be the husband. And so Paul will start off with the husband has to do certain things, and then he'll talk about the wife. And then the next relationship isn't the marriage relationship, it is the parent-child relationship. So then next, we'll, Paul might say, okay, uh, uh, parents, these are your responsibilities, and then he might naturally move to children, these are your responsibilities. And then also found in a home are masters, da 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 da, -da and then also slaves. And you can see then, not just in Paul, but in Peter too, a whole lengthy part of a letter that have these household codes, these exhortations to how we as Christians ought to live, and they're structured according to the relationships within a home or household, the house toflin. And then there's something called, often by scholars, simply closing paranesis or concluding paranesis. Sometimes this is set up as the difference or the shift from the indicative on the one hand to the imperative on the other. I hope you're not intimidated by these Greek terms. So, first of all, the indicative. The indicative is the mood of reality. This is where the speaker kind of declares to the readers who God is and what he's done for them in Jesus Christ. That's the reality. That's the status that we as Christians enjoy. And then naturally, you'd move from the indicative to the imperative, right? In light of what God has done for us in Christ, how now we ought to live, right? What is the natural response we ought to have to that which God has done? So, for instance, um, uh, many scholars then think that Paul will begin by talking about the indicative in the first part of the letter, reminding the readers of, again, God's work of salvation and what he's done for them in Christ, and then he somewhat logically leads into or ends up concluding then with paranesis, with exhortation. So at the end of the letter, you get then the consequences in practical terms about how people ought to live. Now, the function of paranesis is pretty uh, clear, and that is to either change the way people are currently living, if it's bad, Paul wants to make it right, and, uh, or alternatively to reinforce, right? So if they've already made some changes, to make sure that they keep on living in this holy lifestyle to which Christians uh, are called to live. Now, many scholars have looked especially at the vice and virtue list and consider them as relatively fixed. And so, in a certain sense, they argue that they're not so significant because this is like stock commands or just stereotyped exhortation. So, these are the kind of things that Paul says to everybody and any church. In other words, these exhortations aren't aimed at a specific church who are struggling with these specific problems, but they're kind of generic. Now, in some sense, it's true, I think, that that is the case, but in some sense, it's not. So, in one sense, I do think that there is a kind of fixed level of application. I have that all the time as a preacher, and maybe you do too. So, my sermon text can vary from place to place, but once I get to uh, the application, then I have a kind of a riff, right, that I draw on, right? I'll say now, now this, whatever we're talking about, this biblical principle, this impacts, you know, the kind of movie, you know, you're going to choose Netflix to send home to you. This will impact um, how you treat members of the opposite sex. This will impact uh, how eager you are to open God's word and hear him speak to you in prayer. This will impact uh, how much time you spend on your knees talking to him in prayer. This will impact uh, how much you give and how joyfully and cheerfully you give. So I have a set fixed of application, paranesis, that I often add to any sermon, even though the text can change from place to place. 
So I would suspect that Paul and other biblical writers had that too. But having said that, I often will adapt my riff my to the specific passage and, more importantly, to the specific church that I'm writing to. So if I know something about a congregation, I'll tailor that list. I'll tweak it right in such a way so it's more relevant, it's more um, immediate for the particular audience who are getting this message. And so it's easy to imagine the Apostle Paul doing exactly the same thing. So yes, he's got some stereotyped or fixed paranesis in his arsenal to use, but he's a skilled letter writer, and so therefore when you look at those lists, you ought to look at those terms and assume that Paul has shaped or adapted them so that they are specifically relevant for the passage and the church context to which he is addressing. Now, we're shifting here a little bit from epistolary items to other non-epistolary but literary forms. Now that may sound confusing to you, so let me explain that. So, in the letters of Paul and the other letters of the New Testament, we're going to meet fixed expressions which are unique just to letters and to letters alone. But we also meet some other literary devices. So, for example, chiasmus. Chiasmus, maybe you know how that works. That's the X or the Greek letter he, where you have the pattern of A, B, and then you reverse the process, it becomes B prime, A prime. Actually, that's what I suggested to you at the beginning of the letters, you have grace and peace, and then it's inverted at the end, you have peace, and then ultimately grace. Now, that's not technically an epistolary device, a chiasm, because it's found in other forms of writing than letters. In fact, it's found in Hebrew poetry a lot. But Paul and other New Testament writers, they not only know the content of the Old Testament, they also know the forms in which that content comes. And so they'll borrow New Testament writers, not just again the ideas and the words and the theology of the Old Testament, but they'll borrow their literary devices. I can't call it an epistolary device because it's not unique to letters, but it is a literary device. There's a little bit of pun here. It's a it's a cross genre, right? I mean, it's found in different kinds of writing. So it's found not only in poetry, but it's also found in letters. And it's important for you to make sure that you have eyes to see these other non-epistolary but literary forms. And so that could be a chiasmus. I gave an example, uh, I think, earlier in the letter opening of Galatians. Another great example can be found in the Thanksgiving section of Philemon. There's also something called confessional or traditional material, where the biblical writer is borrowing from a confession or a uh, existing uh, saying that the early church has. I gave an example earlier in these videos from the opening of Romans, but other examples could be given too. There's also what many scholars believe to be hymnic material, probably Colossians 1, maybe less so Philippians 2. There's also something called doxologies, to whom be glory forever and ever. Paul didn't make that up. He's borrowing it, not from letters. He's borrowing it from Jewish writings. And you find it many places in the Psalms, Hebrew poetry, but other places too. And so brace yourselves for the idea that you're going to meet these other non-epistolary but literary forms in the letters as well. Well, we're coming to the end of our discussion. We've looked in great detail at the letter opening. We've looked in great deal at the detail at the Thanksgiving section. We've looked in great detail at the at the body, and uh, we haven't looked though in great detail at the letter closing. Now we have looked at that though uh, through the assigned reading. I have a, a an article, a chapter that deals with not only the forms found in the letter closing, but also again how Paul is a skilled letter writer and he can adapt them so that they echo, so that they recapitulate, so that they're better connected to the main purposes of the body of the letter that has preceded them. And so you hopefully know about that already. I have some PowerPoint slides that deal with the letter closing, but I'm not going to explain them. They're hopefully self-explanatory, and especially so in light of the assigned reading on Sincerely Paul, right? The significance of the Pauline letter closing. Well, uh, we've come to the end of a rather lengthy discussion on Paul the letter writer. 
But hopefully now we're going to be that alert reader, not the sleepy reader who's blind to all of these things, but no, we're aware of the epistolary forms available to Paul, and not just to identify them and show off to family and friends, but more importantly to know their function, because that's where the exegetical payoff lies. And so uh, I want to congratulate you on for all the things you've learned, and in a certain sense we can roll up our sleeves now, and, and we can look forward to turning to the different letters of the New Testament and we're going to be in a much better position to uh, understand what the biblical writers under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit was saying first to the original authors then and there and then we'll be in a great position to understand its implications for us here and now.